Can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, I started uh, 4.30. Okay. Uh, this is an AP class. I see two of you already in the honor country. You want to start the AP uh, for the first, I think for the first two, two chapters very similar to the honor class. Because the first two chapters for AP student, I assume you already have a regular country, right? Regular or honor country for a year, right? Tell me if you don't. No? So what class you are in right now at school? Yeah, I'm taking You're taking right now. AP chemistry? Uh, honor. Okay, similar like you guys. So you haven't learned any chemistry before, and then you jump to the honor, and then you want to do AP. Is that right? I'm trying to get, a, get the same thing. You, for you guys, also the same thing. And then for you, you probably already have the honor chemistry done, right? And then you already have this. Uh, yeah, I can. Honor already done, right? Yes, we also do the review, so you will see very similar things. Okay, anyway, for AP, this is the what's gonna be the test, the what things being test is gonna be tested in the AP chemistry. Okay, so it's all based on this. Uh, we call the six big ideas. Okay. For, for owner country, if you learn owners, pretty much you focus on over here. That's a structure of matters, and also this a bonding, this chemical bonding, and also this a intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces determine this physical property, like a solid, liquid, and gases. Okay. So all of these you will learn in this class for the first 10 chapters covered over here. After that, we're going to focus on this. This is actually being tested a lot in AP because this is actually the AP level for the college first year. Chemical reaction, kinetics, uh, thermodynamics, okay? All of this equilibrium. So these are more advanced topics, okay? So we try to finish those things in, let's say, six, six months to Six and a half months actually. Oh, that's good. Oh, okay. You can have a seat over there. And then we also, oh, the parents, can you <laughs> just sit down and sit in a single chair for the table? The parents can sit inside yeah, the room. Oh, here, yeah. yeah. We don't have a lot of table right now. You can sit over there at that, that table, yes. Yeah, parent go inside. You can come over here. Sit yeah. Here. All parent go inside. We yeah. Go inside. Yeah, student are in the classroom. For what? Yeah. No, no, no. For waiting. Oh, 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 we oh, outside. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, oh, if we do not wait here. And you yeah. don't want waiting here, you can, you can, you know, come back around like uh, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, okay. Yeah, 7 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So this, like I said, the first 10 chapters are going to focus on this, and the, the rest of them is over here. So we're going to have a, a lot of advanced topic in this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this last four ideas. Okay, please go through this. Thanks. Okay. So what's being tested? What kind of ability they're going to test it in? One is uh, this uh, logic stuff, okay? Understand the concept logic. And then you're going to have a lot of the data analysis to give you table of data from the data, you got an idea, got this law, figure out using this concept that okay, you learned. The other part is supposed to be this uh, combination of the concept, which means we learn chapter by chapter concept, but you have to put them together to solve the problem. That's always the AP test. Okay, it's not just one chapter concept and then it's based on chapters, based on entire, entire things you learn in chemistry. So that's why it's different from what you learn from your school, okay? So we will see some questions like that. Integrate, we call it integrate, comprehensive, okay, everything. So this is the, basically the content, what you're going to be testing. And the format, the format of the test in AP, you have two sections. So the first section is a 60 multiple choices, okay? You have 90 minutes to finish the test. So you basically, Get into there in the morning, 
finish the first section in 90 minutes. And then you have a, about 10 minutes break. Okay, about 10 minutes break. And then after that, you have a second second part. Second part is we call a three response question. Typically we call the essays. So this uh, you have three long questions and four short ones. Long ones for for the questions you have somewhere between seven to eight questions you need to answer. That's called a long question. Okay. For the short one you may see somewhere between three or five in, in one question, okay? So you have 105 minutes to finish seven questions. So based on what I see, pretty much all the students have finished within the time, no problem. Unless you really don't know what you've been doing, so either way. And for this multiple choice, for multiple choice questions, uh, you don't have any penalty. Not like an SAT subject. You got the wrong, you have penalty. AP, multiple choice, no penalty. So you can do whatever is a, either educated and guess, and you don't know the answer, or you just do the well, you pull whatever powder to determine this is A or B or C or D. It's your choice. Okay. Just uh, fill up all these uh, answer C, okay? Don't leave any penalty, because you got a chance. You got 25% if you don't know the answer. Okay. Free response. So we're going to do specific uh, kind of like exercise and practice if, when, we, when we have this review session for that. So in general, what we see is a uh, free response. You really need to pay attention to the small things, little details. I gave you one example. It's more like a significant figures. That's going to be the first topic we're going to talk about today. Every single time, they're going to check your answer, final answer, to see if you got the right significant figures. You may get the right answer, but if you got a significant figure wrong, you may lose the point. Okay? So every point is a very critical to be able to get a target five. Okay? Everybody want to have five in their team. Okay? So pay attention to the small details. So we will do corresponding test. That also means every single time I give you homework, um, access the worksheet, when they, whenever you do calculation, pay attention to, the, to this, this not small details, okay? Like a unit, like a significant figures. And then also, very, very important, I, I will say this thing probably multiple times during the class. Make sure you have a very neat, clean handwriting to make sure, because all the free response question is read by the, we call the reader. It's like, a, like me, like a person. They're gonna read all your tests. If your handwriting is, uh, is hard to read, you can imagine, okay? You're gonna lose a lot of points. That's what that's the key thing. Another thing is, uh, in, the, in, the, in the free response questions, it's more like uh, you have to you know, know how to answer some questions. You're gonna do responding kind of like a practice. Like a, every every question, they may ask you to explain your answer. That's what we call a justify your answer or explain why it's like that. Because <laughs> that's more like an essay type of question. You need to know how to use the keywords you learn in your principle or concept. Because the, the people read those things, uh, they always scan those keywords. You have those keywords, and then with a the reasonable logic, you got a point. If you don't have this keyword, whatever you say, they don't really care. You lost the point. Right? Pay attention to when you learn chemistry, each concept, what's the key word, what's the key point in each concept and principle. Okay? I would normally give you those, uh, each one of them point by point, so you need to know how to do that. Okay? So this is about the uh, AP test. Any questions about this part? Okay? No? All right. So again, anytime when I talk about anything, you have questions, raise your hand. Feel free to ask any question, okay? Always. And then, if you don't have questions, be prepared. I will ask you questions, okay? So that's 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 important part, okay? I I really want you guys ask as many questions as you can, okay? The more, the better, okay? We learn that way, okay? The more questions you have. The other thing is, uh, you want to read the textbook, because. Uh, 
think about this way, because uh, liberally we have about a seven months to finish all the content. The content is roughly about uh, 20 or 21 chapters. So the book is about uh, 1,500 pages. So you really need to read your textbook in, before you came to the class. Ideally, you have some, some questions come with the class, and then you can learn it. Also, we call it AP class, right? So think about this way. If you go to the college, and then it's the first year you sit in the, in the classroom, if you ever go there and then you got experience, so a college teacher is so one class, they may cover like a two or three chapters sometimes. Okay? So they only give you the key point, key concept. The rest of them is up to you. You need to read your textbook beforehand, after the class. We call it a preview and a review. It's more like a self-study. But I will try my best to give you a lot of detailed information to help you to get through those concepts. Because uh, we are still in the, in, the, in the high school, right? We are learning this, uh, this process. But I will encourage you to learn this skill, ability, self-study. Because that will benefit for your future in the college. In your, in your college, for any subject, it's pretty much majority of the time is self-study. Because uh, the pace is going to be much, much faster. Okay, I'll see you. But I know that. Okay. So this is a, more like a advice for you, suggestions. Okay, try your best. The other thing is uh, practice, practice, practice. I will emphasize that as well. Because uh, if I give you this concept, teach you how to do it, it's more like a sample question. It's only one or two or three. I will introduce different ways to solve problems, but uh, it's up to you to practice. I give you a lot of material in the folder, but you can uh, do it, but practice. If you don't do that, no matter how I teach you, you still cannot get it, okay? That's the key. That's very, very important. Because based on I teaching, why we got a five in the AP test, I ask them later, they do a lot of practice, okay? Whatever the homework I give them, they, they get it done, okay? So, do this, and that's good for you, okay? All right, any questions about this, uh, about this uh, AP test? Yes? Um, is it gonna be on the computer or head? Yes, I have, a, I have a Google Drive folder, okay? I will upload material, so check, uh, after a while, I will update the information, and then you check back, okay? So that's why I give you this uh, contact seat. So next class, I will share the folders, and then you can get access. I have an online textbook, okay? And let me show you the textbook I used. So this is the so this one is the folder I'm gonna share you. So this is this this uh, this is 2000, 2019. So AP test is gonna be in May. Typically, it's the first Saturday in May. It's always the first AP test. Okay. I, I think it's different this year. Different? Yeah. Do you know which day is? I think it's on Thursday. On oh, Thursday, they change it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I haven't checked the date because uh, this year is uh, May May seventh is the first first Monday or something. The first uh, is always the first AP test. Okay. Okay. So this is the folder. You're gonna see this, and uh, I'm gonna share the where's my textbook. This is the. Okay, so this is the textbook I'm, I used. Okay, okay so I will show you the cover and I will come back to this. Okay. Uh, I would say you, you, you may try to download a copy to your, to your computer because I try to, it's up, maybe depends on the internet because at my home I try to read it online version of this book. It takes a lot of time to load the page. Okay. So this is the textbook I used for AP. Okay. So this is the chemistry, the central science, it's a 13 versions. Okay. 
if you are in the in your school, uh, use some other textbook or different version of this same textbook is okay. Okay, pretty much the content they don't change that much. Okay, so that's chemistry. So the other textbook I also uh, use it, and I know some other schools they use this one. Okay, so these two are supposed to be a very popular for AP chemistry, but also for the college. Okay, for the college first year. Introduction of general chemistry and problem. So this one is a based on these two projects. This is a couple. So it's a chemistry. This one is a ninth version. I think they have this year have a new version, but I have I don't have it yet. I normally just use this uh, electronic copy. Okay. All right. This is about the textbook. Okay. Uh, since we are talking about textbook, and uh, I'm gonna say something about this. Uh, Exercise. Okay. So this is the way I gave you the homework. Uh, if you go to the online, this is, this this textbook, you see those are those marked. Those are supposed to be the homework you want to do. Try as many as you can. I don't have a requirement how many you want to do. I I give a lot. You want to do it based on your time. Okay, based on your time. But if you've you done this, you write down a piece of paper, you turn it in, I will, I will take a look at it, I will grade it. And then, if I see some like a common mistake, based on the concept or principle, I will go back to some of those questions, and then show you how to solve this problem. Okay? That's the way we learn. Is that okay? If you have any good idea, let me know, okay? That's how I do it. Besides this, as you can see, I also have this online folder. Online folder, <coughs> you actually have this actual worksheet. So I pull out from other AP teachers, some even from this we call it uh, U.S. National Olympic. Those are previous years test, because this is actually this AP level. So you want to do this as well. More like a multiple choice question, some of the three response questions. And then next year, when we finish all the class, I will upload the final review chapter. That's all supposed to be the practice test. You're going to see quite a bit of those practice tests, previous years. Free respond, and also some of this are full with a multiple choice and free respond. All of that at that time, I will say one more time. I will emphasize at that time, maybe you need to finish all of them. Okay. All right. So this is about a Homework, practice, and then final review things. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Obviously, you want to have something from your school. So you can ask me any questions, even from your school. Okay. Anytime, any, any questions. Okay. All right. So this is the textbook. And first my problem. Uh, looks like we only have a few already got this uh, uh, regular chemistry done, right? Okay. So we do have a new. Let me ask you one more time. Anyone have already have this regular chemistry for one year, right? You finish regular chemistry. What about honor? Including regular honor, anything. You, in other words, you already learned the chemistry for a year. Or maybe during summer, but you, you already have some, you done. Yeah, just look at We only have five. Okay, thanks. Mm. Oh, what's happening?
能帮我去找一下 Siri 吗 ？Siri 哈。对对对，这个这个出问题了。Anyway, so if that's the case, I will probably start it here. And uh, if you already know the concept, you already know it, and just uh, just keep it. And then we, we we need to we need to talk about this anyway. I see two of you, and then you you already learned these things in detail. So this class actually, I plan to do this in more like a fast pace in the first chapter. But uh, anyway. We just go through these things one more time, and then waste a little bit of space. If you have any questions, let me let me know. So, subject of chemistry, we're dealing with a lot of numbers. So numbers will be coming from measurement, right? So we do an experiment. You measure something, you collect the data, and you analyze data, find out a rule, find out a law. So these numbers actually with the meaning. So we do measurement. We have number. We have unit. So for some of them related to chemistry, like uh, the mass of electrons, the mass of protons, those are the, the fundamental elements, the fundamental particles in the, in the atom. So we're going to start it. Obviously, you see those numbers. You see unit of those numbers. And then you have this, uh, this supposed to be called uncertainty. So for the first part of this first chapter, it's going to be dealing with those numbers, right? Dealing with those numbers. So obviously we have this is supposed to be the measurement. And you have the measurement, you have this number, and then you have this unit. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is measurement. The unit of this measurement. Yeah, you can leave that on the table. Okay. Uh, I also try to pass this. This. If you haven't signed your name and then initial, just pass it around. Okay. Thank you. All right. So what we're gonna talk about first is a. Uh, it's supposed to be this. Uh, this a uh, unit of measurement. Okay. So you probably know this. Uh, let me ask you. You guys already know that. So the base unit. You guys know the base unit. It doesn't matter if it's a subject for chemistry or physics. You know the base unit? How many base units do we have? Internet is the world. You have to turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. Anyone knows the base unit? How many base units? What are the base units? You're okay, you don't need to answer that because you just learned it. <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, let's see. Because I give you this, you can write down. So this is supposed to be the base unit. Because if you learn this, uh, if, if you learn this regular chemistry, you're supposed to have these things already. Right? I, I, I just do. didn't want to answer the yeah. question. <laughs> yes. All right, that's fine. Okay. And you probably learned something about this, uh, this experiment hypothesis, conclusion, experiment data, these things. But we don't talk about that anymore. Because uh, AP, we're assuming you already have these things. But AP test, they really don't test you those things. They test you something over here. So all of these supposed to be the base unit. And then, oh, she did, hold on. Everybody sign it? Okay, thank you. If you sign it. So I have nine kids on this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I only use like four. 
not well, books. That's, that's the information, information that's in sign attendance. Sign in, you need to write down your name and then you initial your name under the date. That's meaning you are here. So those the information sheet is different. Okay. So as you can see here, the base unit, the most important thing related to this uh, this chemistry is uh, is pretty much its mass. Okay. Every time you do the experiment, something you do the measurement, so you need to measure the mass of this uh, this compound or whatever they give it to you, right? The next one is supposed to be the time. And then we also have this a uh, very important one is a uh, thermodynamic temperature. Thermodynamic temperature. So you probably pretty much every every time you see this temperature we report it in our weather forecast is far high, right? We also have this Celsius degree. But right now you need to know this is supposed to be the Kelvin. The thermodynamics. In all chemistry, we only focus on thermodynamics. Okay. Yes. Is a mass supposed to be gram instead of kilogram? <coughs> it's kilograms. But I thought kilogram is like a suffix for it. Mm -hmm. It's suffix. Yes. But so the base unit should be should be should be kilograms. Where's those kilograms? It's still kilograms. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other questions about this? Okay. So. Go back to this thermodynamics temperature is uh, from now on you think about it in temperature in thermodynamics temperature. So therefore, if they give you any Celsius degree, pretty much a lot of cases probably give you this Celsius degree. And you I'll give you the equation you know how to convert it to the to the Kelvin. So right now you think about the temperature it's supposed to be in Kelvin. Okay, Kelvin. And then in chapter 10 we will talk about gas and gas laws. You know why this uh, this temperature converted factor. You know this factor where this factor coming from. Okay. And then we have this uh, amount of substance. This amount of substance is very very important because we can measure the mass, but all the calculation in chemistry is depend on this amount of a substance. We call it moles. Okay, moles. So you see, all the chemical equation is depend on these moles. And then you will see the relationship between this uh, mass and its moles. Okay, so that's in chapter three. We call it stoichiometry calculation. So for any chemical reactions, we try to figure out this uh, amount of the substance change before and after reaction. We have to go through this concept. It's very very important. Okay, pretty much entire chemistry depends on this. And then you will know why. Why we need to use this? Okay. And then the fundamental law control this is actually that we call it the law of conservation of mass. Okay. So which means we cannot destroy any substance. Whatever we put it in, we have to get amount, the same amount. That's why we say it's amount. Okay. So that's the foundation. With this, we also have this uh, we call the derived unit, which means we combine some base unit and then give us a new unit to describe dif different properties. For example, this uh, this a volume. Volume is very important in terms of uh, when we dealing with a uh, gas molecule, when we dealing with the uh, solution. So that's volume. When we dealing with the uh, gas molecule, we also have this pressure, also very important. Okay, pressure. And then we have energy. So energy meaning for any chemical reaction, there's always energy involved. So that's what we call the thermodynamics. Okay, thermodynamics specifically dealing with energy. And with this energy, we actually can predict some of this reaction. Is it possible to happen or not spontaneously? Okay. So we can based on this energy term to determine those. Okay. So that's entirely. You got two chapters to deal with this energy in the chemistry. And I will guarantee you will have one question in the free uh, in the free response kind of things related to the energy calculation. Okay. And then we have this function of this uh, power voltage, frequent, uh, power voltage, and then electrical charge. So this we have a, we have one chapter dealing with the uh, oxidation reduction reaction. That's dealing with the uh, electrons, and that's dealing with the voltage. That's we call it electrochemistry. Okay. All this is supposed to be the, the electron in and out. Based on we call a reduction potential. So that's the voltage. The voltage. And then the frequencies are actually this light. Okay, every single light you see, 
You see the visible light, you see different colors. That's because uh, I have a different wavelengths of the light. Okay? So therefore, for wavelengths, frequency has to be also light. So we're going to deal with this in the, we call it electron configuration, which means the property of electron in the atom. For this frequency, there's also dealing with the electron, is that electron is actually control the chemical properties. Okay. So therefore, you will see quite a bit, we, we have, uh, we have three ch uh, two chapters to talking about this electron in chemistry. And then later when we talk about, when we put this atom together to make molecules, that's also related to the electron. So the electron is actually very, another very important concept, another very important particle in the, in, the, in the chemistry, okay? So this is supposed to be the unit, okay? Unit. Okay, let's take a look at some of this unit conversion. So we talk about this, uh, this, uh, this Kelvin temperature, right? So this, uh, if I know this uh, Celsius degree to convert to Kelvin, that's supposed to be 273.5. So you need to know this number, and later you know where this number coming from, okay? So this is a, anytime I give you this uh, Celsius degree, say for example, in this room right now is pretty hot, probably 25 Celsius degree. So I convert to Kelvin, you basically 273 plus 25, 298 Kelvin, okay, 298 Kelvin. So we will use some, some numbers, so calculation should be okay, okay, should be all right. So this is the temperature for the pressure Atmosphere pressure, everybody knows that, right? So, if we say atmos atmosphere pressure, we say this is a 760 millimeter mercury. We use mercury to do that measurement. Okay. And then when we talk about this uh, in more detail in gas chapter, we will give you uh, one, two, three, three more unit, three more unit for, for pressure. So you have four different unit, different numbers, to describe, to calculate the pressure. Okay, right now I just gave you one. It's millimeter mercury. Uh, in the AP test, they gave you a cheat sheet. Okay, you have got a periodic table, and you will see the atomic number, atomic mass, and then with the chemical symbol. That's all you have for periodic table. And then you have a equation sheet, and then you have this we call a constant, more like a unit conversion. Those numbers. Okay. But ideally, I want you to remember some of these symbol numbers because you don't want to in your test back and forth to flip, oh, what's this number, what's this number, okay? Get yourself familiar with these numbers, okay. This is the pressure. And then we have this uh, energy. Energy, long time ago, we actually used a lot of, we call it calorie. This calorie is supposed to be a lowercase calorie. So this is the one calorie is supposed to be we have one gram of water, we increase uh, by one degree, the energy is supposed to be one calorie, lowercase. Right now we use uh, everything uh, based on joule, so this number is supposed to be 4.184 joule from one calorie. This is the lowercase calorie. If you read your food label, we have a capital calorie. This calorie is equal 1,000 lowercase calorie. So you see, you can imagine if you, if you if you eat something, let's say 200 calorie, and then you can convert it to lowercase calorie, and then you can convert it to the how many joule energy you put in. Okay. So all of this energy actually, if you eat food, is actually stored in the chemical bond. Okay, all this chemical bond. So that's why you try to break the bond, you form the new bond in the chemical reaction. There's energy involved, so over here, okay? In calories, or in joule. Okay. So this is supposed to be the, the conversion, a few of them. And then we will see quite a bit later, if, depends on what, what unit we talk about, what concept uh, we're gonna talk about in, the, in, the, in the each chapter. Another one is very quick, is basically you know all of this, the, in chemistry we use a metric system, so therefore, everything depends on 10. You either multiply by 10 or divide by 10, okay? So that's 
So this, I don't need to spend too much time about that. And this is a, the, the table. You'll probably see these things. May not be in the chemistry related, maybe in any scientific subject classes, you may see this table, right? Yes? No? <laughs> okay. Something related to chemistry more often is a, is a kilo, right? Kilograms or, or kilometers. And then we have this, uh, supposed to be this uh, milliliter, the volume, right? We have liter, we have milliliter. You will see a lot of milliliters. We also have this nano, nano meaning the, the wavelengths. You all have something calculated wavelengths. And we also have this femital, femital meaning the time for some of the chemical reaction, they can happen at a very, very short time. They call a femtosecond. second. Okay. And some reaction can happen very, very long time, in a year. Okay. So they have a very big window for, for chemical reactions. Okay. So this is supposed to be that. The, the metric system. Okay. All right. So this is a part of this uh, uh, measurement, and then we're going to talk about. It. You do the measurement. You got a number. It's a number with uh, obviously some uncertainty in there. So it's uncertainty meaning not sure. It's a, why is not sure? So what things can introduce those uh, those uncertainties are related to this error and uncertainty. Okay. Uncertainty more like. A, the reliability stuff. So therefore, we're going to talk about these two type of errors in this uh, measurement. So the first thing is uh, instrument. Instrument meaning if I have a good quality of an instrument versus the, a poor quality instrument. Even though I have a very high quality of instrument, but when I do the maintenance, I haven't done a good job to calibrate the instrument. So you will introduce this we call a instrument or instrumental errors. Okay. So those supposed to be either the measurement shaped to a little bit smaller numbers compared to the true value or maybe a little bit larger. Okay? And then you try to get rid of this uh, instrumental these errors. It doesn't depend on the number of measurement. You measure a lot, you still cannot get rid of this guy. Unless you through throughout this old piece of the instrument, get a new one, or you do a good maintenance, do a good calibration before you measure it. Okay. So probably, for some of this, uh, I know this uh, uh, different school, they have this, uh, this we call a, uh, later we have this measurement based on this uh, absorption versus the concentration of the solution. So you do need to do the measurement before you measure the concentration or measure this absorption, you need to calibrate the instrument very well. Otherwise, you pretty much all the numbers off. Okay. So that's why you won't have this uh, instrumental arrows. You need to get the baseline correctly, and then you do the measurement. Okay. That's pretty much in the AP level uh, chemistry. If you learn AP in your, in, at your school, you probably have this experiment. But we have to go through that with, with the paperwork, not in the lab. <laughs> So this is supposed to be the, the instrument arrows in this case. And then we also have this, uh, this random arrow. This is actually the person operate this, uh, this instrument, do the measurement, right? try to measure something. And then make some like a careless mistake, or they may not realize some, something. But this is a very random. Very random meaning if I do a lot of measurement, I would try to even them out, get rid of those arrows. So the average measurement. Okay. So that's why whenever we try to measure something or you try to repeat something normally, because I also have the industry background, we repeat it how many times? Five or ten times for measurement, for experiment. Sometimes maybe a hundred, two hundred times. Because we have to have a very reliable data before we can say anything have a conclusion. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what we try to do. We try to get rid of these uh, random arrows. We may not realize, so after you do a lot of measurement, you try to get rid of those things. Okay. That's why we try to do it. So this is the, where these, uh, these arrows come from. Once you have this, we cannot get rid of them, no matter how, how good, how profound is the instrument and how careful we do the measurement. 
we still have those things in there. So therefore, we have to wait to describe that. We have to tell somebody, whoever try to use our data, right? We have to give them an idea. So therefore, we have this absolute error versus the percent error to report. So every time you write your, your report, you have this data for your final result, you have to give some of this percent error. Okay? Normally, we give it percent error. Absolutely, what I'm supposed to do, the expected value subtract the major one. So if I give you examples, it's like this. Okay? So if we try to measure something like, say, 8 grams of all sugar, so this is a very typical thing. You use a balance, you measure, measure, measure. So every time you've got a number, so so things like that, OK? So in this case, I have this target number. These are the number you measure. So therefore, you use whatever the measure, subtract the target one. This is the value. You divide by the target one. That's give you the numbers. Okay. So you may have some calculation. You have some measurement. And you, you calculate it. You have your final answer. You still have something like this reported in each measurement. Okay. So this is supposed to be the differences between these two numbers. And you divide by some number, you'll give you a percentage. So this is supposed to be the the arrows. We also have another another thing to talk about is supposedly the measurements we call it reliability. I certainly reliability. So that's meaning I have two things to to evaluate this measurement. It's good or not. Okay. What's the quality of your measurement? So in this case we have this called a precession versus the accuracy. Okay. Precession which means uh, I have different measurement, we compare those measurement with the measurement, okay? Just measurement, how close those numbers with each other. If they are very close with each other, we call it a very high precession, <coughs> very high precession. So for example, if you look at these three different kind of measurements in this case, for the first one, these three measurements, they are all different from each other, right? So which means they have a very low precession, measurement versus measurement. Okay. If you look at this set of data, they all close to each other with very small differences, measurement to measurement. So this set of data with a very high precession. So this we call a precession. Precession is just a, how you, in your measurement this is reproducibility. It's, okay, reproducibility. Accuracy is different. Accuracy meaning I have each measurement to compare the value I try to target. It's a true value, okay? So every single one is supposed to be close to the value I want. That's what we call it accuracy. It's a measurement versus the target number. So if you look at this, for this one is a measurement is actually away from this target value. So very poor accuracy. So for this set of data, both the accuracy and precession are very bad. Okay. And this one, we have very good or high precession. Because measurement versus measurement, they are very close to each other. But all of these measurements are actually away from this uh, target value. So you may un analyze this data, why my measurement looks like. Hi, I'm sorry, do you know where I can find the keys for the bathroom? No, bathroom is right here. Oh, I don't have to go all the way up there. I knew that. You don't need to go there. But that, that one is, they always lock the up. So we have our own. Mm -hmm. Yes, more convenient. All right. So this is supposed to be this one, right? For this one, you look at this side of data, you may have some problem from your instrument. Because all the measurement, you are very careful, right? Because you got a measurement to measurement, they are very close to each other. However, I systematically got a, this whole thing is off, right, to the true value. You may have some like an instrument problem. So that's maybe just one type of, of this, uh, this reason to get you this set of data, right? So when you look at those data, you compare this reliability, you will actually kind of understand. Is that 
I made a mistake, something, or is this supposed to be I need to do a, a calibration for my instrument, right? Or I need to really upgrade my instrument, things like that. Okay. For the last one, obviously, every single measurement, they are very close to each other, which means a very high precession. And then they all hit the close to the like this. They all try to get the same kind of like a true value. So which means very high accuracy at work. So those are actually the, the very high quality data. So therefore, we have to use these two things to evaluate the measurement. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Okay. So in this case, we're going to talk about this, uh, this uncertainty. This uncertainty exactly comes from this what? Comes from the measurement, right? If it's coming from measurement, which means uh, it depends on the instrument, right? We're going to talk about a few of these uh, glassware you probably use it. In your, in your experiment, in the chemistry, in the chemistry lab. So this piece of glass where we call that burite, right? You know that? Anyone knows this or you don't know that? You probably don't know that. You guys know that or not? Have you guys used this before? No? Okay. So this we call a burite. This burite, you can measure the, the volume of liquid. You can get any number of the volume of liquid. Okay. So that's called the right. And the instrument, this one that you're going to use in the, in the experiment, one of them we call an asset-based technician. Okay. So you will probably do this experiment at school. And then we will talk about this one, titration in detail in, in the, I think it's chapter 16, asset-based reaction. Very important. And that's, that's part of this, uh, this AP country. It's always going to have some some calculation about this part, okay? So this one. Now, if you look at this, uh, you need to learn how to read these uh, numbers. Because uh, one, uh, one time, they actually gave you those, uh, those, those pictures and ask you to read. They ask you to read the numbers, meaning they ask you to write down the right the number of this, uh, this, how many significant figures I need to write it down for the result. This is actually in the real AP test, okay? So I want you to pay attention to this. So this one, if you use it, if you can take a look, in this case, I have 20 to 21, it's only change of one milliliter, and then you have 10 markers between that, which means each marker is equal 0 0.1, right? 0 0.1. So if you read this one, suppose it's 20, and then you have 0 0.1, right? So that's meaning, no matter who read it, you always have this, uh, 20.1, 20.1, right? Everybody has 20.1, right? And then you see this, uh, this is a menis meniscus, right? Everybody know this, right? Liquid, you have this, uh, this is supposed to be the aqueous solution, this meniscus. When you read this, you want to have this reading at the bottom, and then you crop this, uh, these markers, right? So therefore, in this case, this is the, not very clear, hopefully you can see it. This is between this point 0.1 and point 0.2, right? So this last digit you see five, four, six, seven, six. It depends on you or me or whoever read it. Because this one is supposed to be what? This last digit is supposed to be uncertain, one, right? Depends on the measurement. Depends on the operator right? who read it. So therefore, this one is not reliable anymore. The first three, they always supposed to be a certain number. Certain meaning. It's for sure. It's everybody's saying. So this, therefore, we have four, in this case, four significant figures. So we have three certain digits plus one uncertain. So for any significant figure, you always have one uncertain number in there, right? One digit is be, the last one is going to be uncertain. Okay, last one is going to be uncertain. So this meaning, if I use the burette to write to do the measurement to get the data, I need to have four significant figures in this case. Okay. So in, in other words, in your test, they ask you to read out this number. You need to write down this, and then you change another one, they give you another one, you write down another this uh, four significant figures, this measurement. And then you have the differences 
s equal to volume of liquid, right? That change the difference between the two numbers. Okay. So this is supposed to be the the bureau, how to use the bureau to do the measurement. Okay. And how many how many certain digits, how many uncertain digits you can have. Okay. Right? So this is the bureau. And we also have others. Graduate cylinder probably everyone used it right before, right? You guys use this? Even though it's not supposed to be in the chemistry, some somewhere you're gonna use these things, right? So this one is also can do the measurement for for the for the liquid, the volume, right? So in this case also we can get a, any number of volume, right? For liquid. For liquid. So this this case, the graduate cylinder, if you measure, you see this uh, this the after the decimal, the first digit already is a uncertain number. If you compare this bureau, bureau is supposed to be after the decimal, the second one is uncertain. So therefore, the bureau give you more accuracy than this one, right? Yes. So that's why when we do this measurement, in particular when, they, when we use this one in the, we call a titration experiment, we need to measure the volume with very high accuracy and precision. So that's why we have to use a, a, a good instrument, right, in this case, with a better, it's an uncertainty, smaller uncertainty. We don't use this one, okay? This one is general things, we just roughly get an idea what's the volume of, what, of the liquid. But it's still better than the baker, still better than the early man flask you were used, okay? Because that's why we don't use a baker to measure up the volume of liquid, we have to use a gravity sign to do that. Okay? So this one, even though it's a not like this, we still have a very good accuracy in this case. So this is a graduate cylinder, which is a direct. After that, we have this one we call a volumetric flask. Volumetric volumetric flask. You still can measure the, the volume of a solution or liquid, but it's only one volume with very high accuracy. We only use it for uh, when we prepare the solution. So we have a, a chapter called a solution. So you do the measurement, or you determine the, measure, the, the determine the solution concentration. This is the one you try to use. Okay. So this one we have. You can have different sizes: 25, 50, 100. We somehow have 500, one liter. Because when you do your lab, uh, your teacher, school teacher, or chemistry like me. So we, we need to prepare those solution for you, right? So we cannot prepare a very dilute one with very big big volume, right? We cannot do that. We have to concentrate it, and we use these guys with reasonable size. And then you do the dilution. I, I tell you, you're adding how many milliliters of water, so therefore you have another concentration, okay? So we'll talk about that, and that's supposed to be the volumetric flask, okay? You also need to know how to prepare a solution. This is the piece of glassware you need to choose. Which means, if they give you some multiple choice questions, I want to prepare a solution with this concentration, this volume. Do I need to choose this a graduate cylinder? Do I use a burette or do I use a volumetric flask? You have to use this volumetric flask with the with the size of the solution volume, right? So that's what we use. Okay. So this is a this is the a few of these uh, glassware you're going to see in the in the chemistry. Okay? Now it's more like a the important stuff coming in, significant figure, okay? Mm -hmm. So this first part, you need to know this. If you know this, just follow this, okay? The significant figures is more like a focus on the a zero. If you know zero is counted as a sig fig or not, you pretty much know how to do this uh, significant figures. So in this case, we have this uh, <coughs> Atlantic Pacific rule. This is a, if you look at a, this map, we have this uh, West Coast Pacific Ocean here, right? And then we have East Coast Atlantic Ocean. This meaning, if I have a decimal present, we have Pacific, Pacific group. If we don't have decimal, we follow Atlantic. So what does it mean? I gave you numbers. So the first one is supposed to be zero. Okay, we say zero, let's say um, 408, so this, we still use 408, 
any zeros between these two numbers, these are the non-zero numbers, those zeros always counted as a significant figure, right? So that's a one type of zero. Second one is a, if I have decimal, 0 0.0040, okay? So in this case, I have a decimal. I need to follow this uh, specific rule. Specific rule meaning I start to find out this uh, sig fig from this left hand side. So from the left hand side, any zeros doesn't count as a sig fig. So we cross out. Until we see the first number is not zero, four. Then we start to count. One, two, three, four. Even though the last number is zero, I need to count it as a sig fig. So therefore, for this one, we have four sig fig. Okay. So this is a specific rule, which means I have decimal, these guys, this little guy. Okay. If I don't have decimal, let's say 40A0, this case I need to follow this one, decimal absent Atlantic. I need to count the sig fig from right hand side. So the first number is not zero, it's this guy. So this zero doesn't count as a sig fig. So we have one, two, three. So once you start to count, any number is counted as a sig fig. Same thing. So this one is supposed to be three, sig fig. Okay? Any questions about this part? Should be okay? All right, and now we have one more. It's supposed to be scientific notation. So we use this one. 4.080 times 10 to the power over five, okay? So we know this is what we call a exponent, right? Exponent. And this part we call a coefficient, right? So for any scientific notation, those numbers, we only focus on the, the coefficient, using coefficient to determine the sig fig. So in this case, we still follow the same rule, Atlantic Pacific. Obviously, you're going you're gonna to have this decimal for this case. So therefore, this one follow this rule. How many sig fig over here? Four. Four, right? So therefore, for this scientific notation number, sig fig is will be four sig fig. Okay, so right now you just uh, just get this uh, these four rules under control. You'll be fine. Okay. So that's about is a uh, sig fig. How to identify the number of sig fig for any number? I gave it to you. So therefore, we can go back to this, and this pretty much what we talked about over here. And this is the first question. Let's just do a quick, simple exercise. Okay. How many sig fig for first one? Second one? Six. Yeah. Okay. Think about these two numbers. What's the difference between these two numbers? Yes? Um, it's because if it's just 5.08, um, uh -huh. it could be 5.081 or 5.082, but then if you write 5.080, then like you know for certain that it's zero. Okay, everybody agree with her? Or you have a different idea? Just one more step of accuracy. Like for example, if you have a cylinder, um, and then you know each lines you may go beyond the one, but then when you have one actual sig fig, you mean that one additional line. Right there. Yes. If that makes sense. Okay. Yes. So, in other words, you're talking about is which one is give you more accurate measurement second accuracy, one. the second one, right? So, for the first number, which number is an uncertain number? Eight. Eight, right? For the second one is a zero, zero right? So based on these two numbers, can you tell me? Which one you use the, the in terms of this instrument? Which one is better? The second one, the second one right? <laughs> right? Okay. So therefore, later when you when you read somebody's uh, paper, they give you some number, right? You compare two different papers. 
So you, based on this, uh, the number they reported, you actually can estimate which one use a better instrument, right? And then you can get an idea, do I need to trust this one or do I need to trust this one more, right? Okay. All right. Next one, A, B, C. First number, how many say fake? One, one two, 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 two or one? One. Two. Two. One? Somebody? Yeah, there's no point. There's, there's no zero left. Yeah, but that's the whole point of decimal <laughs> point. <laughs> so in other words, I write down 60 versus a 60 point. Why I put a point there? I will put the decimal over there. So therefore, this one is uh, like this. This one is only one sig fig, right? This one has two sig fig. Just that's the point. It doesn't do anything. Uh, oh, it does. Yeah, it like is. the first one, it might be just like sixty. Yes. The second one is like it can be uh, one or two. Uh, uh, follow this rule, right? Uh, okay. So the, the yeah, the third one is easy to understand, right? So this one is supposed to be how many? Three, right? Okay. So this is a identify the, the number, a sig fig number, a sig from, from each one of these. Uh, but this is just the first step. Because, uh, okay, so this is a good time to, to tell you guys. So next class, bring your calculator, the one you, you're going to use in your AP test. Okay? It's, it's more like a, a programmable, like a I. Is that TI or yeah. IT? Is TI 83 or 84, whatever the fancy one you have? Okay. Yeah, because some they can actually do this programmable system. You can you can use it in the AP test, no problem. But you have to you have to, what do you call it? Reset or something. There's nothing in there. But anyway, let's do first number. How many significant figures? Five. Five. Three, 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 four, 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 two, four, two, two, three, three, three. Yes. Okay. So good. You got it. All right. So, like I said, this is just the first step. You identify the number. So probably in your in your in your questions you have a lot of numbers, right? So when you read through those uh, those questions, you know the numbers, you know how many sixes in there, right? And then you do a lot of uh, calculation, right? But you have the calculator, you do a plunge in, you don't care about this, uh, and then you see a lot of the a lot of numbers coming out, right? A big number. So how can we determine after I try to box this uh, final answer, what number I need to report, right? So this we follow this uh, calculation, these two rules for calculation. The first one is that uh, if we're dealing with a multiplication and then division. So in this case, we follow the number with the smallest uh, sig fig. Whoever has the smallest sig fig, that will determine the final answer, how many sig fig in there. So in this case, if you try to calculate the volume, we have this first number is a four sig fig, second one is a two, Third one is a uh, second one is a, is a three. This one is a two. So this two sig fig, this number is only two sig fig. That will determine your final answer. So it will be two sig fig. Okay. So if you punch those numbers in your calculator, you end up with this. And then you write down this in your final result. If they do care about a sig fig, you lost the point. You you know what I'm saying, right? So therefore, you box your answer. So will be with the right sig fig, 4.8 is supposed to be the, the box answer for your final in your test. Okay. So this is the smallest the, the number for sig fig to determine this uh, multiplication and division. Okay. We also have this addition and then subtraction. This one we need to looking for the number with the largest uncertain uncertainty. So in this case I give you 0.1010. 0 0.101, 0 0.10, 0 0.1. So you do this calculation, it's supposed to be 0, 2, 0, 4. Okay? So how many sig fig I need to have? I need to follow this uh, largest uncertainty. Which one has a, these four numbers, which one has the largest uncertainty? So you do one by one. The first one, where is the uncertain number? Which, which number from the first number is the uncertain number? 
is always the last one, right? You only have one digit, one digit for the for the uncertain. So the last one so will be the uncertain so over here. Second one is this guy, right? And then zero and this one. So which one has the largest uncertainty? Is this last number, right? Because this one is in the tens, hundred, thousand, this is a ten thousand, right? This is thousand, this is a hundred, this is ten, right? Average of decimal, right? Yes. I actually have a question about the first rule. The first rule, yes. Oh, so basically, you know how that normally they give you a periodic table? Yes. And then you have to give calculation of like, say, like one mole of like H2O. Yes. And then that's like around, what, 18.02 yes. um, gram, right? Yes. So do we treat 18.02 as a exact number or should we treat it with six feet, four six feet? That's the exact number, right? So we should treat it as, as the exact, exact number. number instead of like the same thing. Yes. Because I always get confused when I'm doing calculation, converting between moles and grams. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So that will be treated as exact. Yes, I think so. So that's why you have based on this mass they gave it to you. Yeah, based on the Yeah, based on the mass, table. yes. Yes, that's a very good question. The other way is uh, you do calculation in the chemistry in the AP test. They gave you the periodic table. So therefore, when you calculate it for any any molecule is more we call a molar mass. We, for you guys haven't learned anything when we dealing with that. You have to use this uh, number to give it to you in the periodic table. Exact number. That's that's why they give you this uh, so hydrogen is 1.08, something like that. Okay? So you have to use that specific exact number. That we call it exact number. Okay? So I'm gonna talk about exact number after this. So exact number actually has a infinity of a sig fit. So you don't care about this number at, at all. So they those numbers doesn't influence your, your final result, okay? Whatever the sick thing. Is that clear? Okay. So for this question, okay, we go back to this. It's actually this last digit gives you the, the largest uncertainty, therefore the cutoff is over here. So you only have this uh, 0 0.4. Okay. So the reason for that is that this is number four is already supposed to be the uncertain number, right? So any number after uncertain, there's no meaning because this thing's uh, just drop. okay? So again, I have a message, it's supposed to be rounding, right? You guys don't know the rounding, right? Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for number three, the exact that you gave, wouldn't it be 20 foot, um, 40 without the I got same? a point there. No, but 1407, that's seven, that's four seconds. Mm -hmm. And seven is there. Oh, this seven is over here. So, so then you're trying to get the same numbers. That's so that's that's why this one gave you the largest uncertainty, right? So that's why I have I have to put a point over here to give me this number, right? Like zero. So zero have to be counted in there. Zero so those be the uncertain number, right? Yeah. Very good. Very good. You understand or not? Okay. But this way, probably a little bit better. I put these things over here, and then I give you this. Hopefully, this one is easy to understand. But this, I have to do the calculation in front in the calculator to determine that. All right, any questions about this part? Calculation? OK, calculation, OK. All right, so like I said, and you also mentioned this is supposed to be the, 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 the exact number. What's the meaning of exact number? Typical is a unit conversion. That's why you get this uh, yeah, molar mass right. stuff. So therefore, we, we already see this one lowercase color equal 4.184 joule, right? This 4.184, how many things in there? Not four. Not four. Infinity. Infinity. Because this is a exact. Because uh, whatever I give you, one color is always, always equal to this uh, 4.184, no matter what. Okay, that's what we call an exact number. So they have an exact meaning, they have an infinity of a sig fig. So in other words, this is a very, very high accuracy in, in other words. This is more like a standard. Everybody accept this number as this conversion. So that's mean what? That's mean, like you see here, right? If I have one kilogram, it's always a, a thousand gram, right? This thousand is supposed to be the exact number, right? So therefore, this thousand is supposed to be like an infinity of uh, sig fig. 
So anytime you do this uh, unit conversion, whatever this coefficient over here, treat it at an uh, exact number. And then you don't worry about this, uh, how many sig fig I put it in, doesn't matter. You just focus on the number they give it to you, maybe a mass, or maybe volume, maybe pressure, right? And then you convert to the others, you just based on the number they give it to you, whatever the coefficient, you don't count it as sig fig. Good? Okay, that for example, we know this uh, 1.5 atmosphere, right? We know one atmosphere equals this 760 millimeter mercury, right? So you do this conversion, final answer depends on this number, right? If I say 1.5 atmosphere equals how many millimeter mercury, this is a exact number. This one is a, the number you need to use it to determine your final result. So you have two sig fig for the final, if I convert it to this uh, middle meter work. Is that, is that okay? Good? All right. Okay. Um, oh. We already talked about scientific notation because that's when we talk about this uh, sig fig. So, I just do a quick check for you guys. You guys know this, right? Because uh, sometimes when you write down your answer, in, in particular, you end up with these numbers. How to write it in the scientific notation way? So the first number, if you write down as scientific notation, how do you do that? What's this number equal? And how many sig figs supposed to be in your in your result? It's supposed to be three, right? You still have three. This one you have. Uh, how many? Five. This one is a five. five right? This thing's okay, right? I think for math, you do these things quite often, right? So I don't, I don't need to worry about that. Okay. Another one is, a, as you can see here, it's supposed to be the density, right? Density. And that is a, we say it's a ratio, because we have so many concepts later in the, in, the, in the class, each chapter. We're going to use a lot of this ratio game. Okay, a lot of concept depend on that. So density is one of them. Okay, so it's only mass over volume. And density for for owner country probably the first first lab you probably do is a, actually the density lab something like that. So they give you a piece of any material you try to measure their their density, right? So you measure the mass, you try to figure out the volume. If it's a regular shape, you do this uh, whatever is a lens, right? What is and if it's not regular, um, you already know that, it will probably, let's say if I have this, uh, this piece of rock, okay, how to determine this rock density? Yes, go ahead. The water displacement. Yes, water displacement. Okay, everybody know this. Good. So you measure the mass, you measure the volume, so you basically put them into a, whatever is with a marker, right? Before and after you see the volume change. So that's supposed to be the, the volume of this piece of rock, right? So that's how you identify the density of some material you know, right? Right? Is that? Okay, good. So this is, a, we will talk about that later, and then we will see that. Actually, we have so many ways to identify the substance, and then how to identify the substance is actually one of these uh, kind of the tasks in the, in the chemistry. Okay. Right. So, next one is a we call a systematic uh, problem solving. This is a is quite quite important as well. This we call a dimensional analysis. Okay. Anybody? Anyone doesn't know this dimensional analysis? <laughs> no. Okay. Let me give you this. I always use this example. Okay. If you have one year, equal how many seconds? How to do that? Can you have to see who's calculator? <laughs> yeah, you can use calculator. Yes, the factor, right? The conversion factor, right? So typically we say if we have one year and we go to days, right? Mm -hmm. 365 days, right? And then we know if we have one day, how many hours we have one day? 24 hours, right? If we have one hour, so how many 
60 minutes, right? And I, we have one minute. That's a 60 second, right? So as you can see, I'm changing from one unit based on this uh, factor and then convert to the other one. Right? I have the answer. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, you go <laughs> Did you Google it or did you calculate it? No, I calculated it. Oh, excellent. What's this number? I haven't calculated it. 3153. 3153. 6. 6. And then 30. Okay. Excellent. Does that seem right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So now you count it, right? How many seconds you, you subtract from here? That's for one year. Right? So this is a, we will use a lot of these things in a calculation. So they can serve you very well. One thing is, uh, you probably get these things under, understand in this way, right? Because later when we talk about is mass versus moles, or the concentration, all of these actually, we can do this calculation based on this conversion, dimension analysis. The other way is, uh, once you do a lot of calculation, you understand concept, you can use this one to check your answer. Do I got the right answer? Okay. So that's the way to check. In particular, sometimes you don't need to do the calculation. I just check these numbers and check the unit. I can find out. I can get rid of some of the wrong answer quickly. Okay. But this is how to use it. How to do this calculation. And as you can see here, you got a module. You got a you got a conversion factor over here. We already talked about this. And then this one is actually what I mentioned. It's about the, we're going to learn this, the amount of substance, these moles, and then we use this molar mass. And then we also have this Avogadro's numbers. Okay? So in other words, I can say, if I have one gram of water, how many atoms in there? You can use this one to do the calculation, the maximum analysis. Okay? So we will see that when we talk about that. Um, I do mention these things actually in the, in the previous, but this one for AP, not that important, but for you guys from the honor country, this is important. Just saw this graph somewhere on my... Yeah, in your, in your, in your textbook. This is actually summarize this, this three most common temperature we use. So the Fahrenheit in the United States, and we use a lot of Fahrenheit for the for the temperature weather forecast, right? And then the Celsius degree is somewhere in the China, because I grew up in China. When I first came here, I see Fahrenheit, I know Fahrenheit, they say it's a, it's at that time it's a, in the summer, it's more like a 95 or 98 Fahrenheit, and I'm like, wow, what's the Celsius degree? I don't know. <laughs> I still use Celsius on my phone. Oh, that's and good. I never commented to that. Yeah, Fahrenheit is like, sometimes. Oh, not doing that. But you do have this equation that will help you to do this conversion. So therefore, in your cell phone, it's actually they have this calculator. These things are already calculated automatically for you. But for us right now, one more time to emphasize this, don't think about these things anymore. Think about uh, Calvin, 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 okay? Everything's Calvin. Because in particular, if you do this in AP test, and then most cases in the, in the subject SAT test, they always give you Celsius degree. They always, always give you Celsius degree. And then there's always a trap question. It's a, the, red, the red answer is always right after there's a trap one. It's over here, based on the Celsius degree. You always need to convert it to Kelvin, you know, no matter what, OK? Kelvin, right now. In your head, Kelvin, no other temperature. <laughs> OK, all right. So this is about the. Temperature, this is about the dimensional analysis. So this is more like a preparation. So I normally think about it. you already have these things done, but what do you do? It's still okay. We do just quick review. Now we move on to the real things about chemistry. So what we're gonna talk about for chemistry, what things in chemistry are the, the interest for us, and what the, what things we started. This is supposed to be the matter. Everything is a matter. And then what's the meaning of matter? Or what's the matter? Somebody, you ask them, what's the matter? In this case, we have, we have something, whatever it is, you have to, you, have, you can feel it in your hands, more like a, you have this mass. 
and they also have this uh, volume, right? Occupy separate space. So those things we call up the matter. Right? But for chemistry, this is just the first step. We are create, we need to study their building block, which means what's what's the what's the fundamental stuff in there, right? To make this matter. So in this case we have two things: atoms and molecules. Those are the subject, those are the things that we try to understand. Basically, in chemistry, we try to make these guys, make those molecules, from, from a set of molecules, change it to make another set of molecules. Okay. And more, we call it efficiently, effectively, and economically. Okay, that's the chemistry. And so therefore, we need to understand all of this, uh, this from one set of molecule to the other set of molecule, what about the energy involved, right? How to control their reaction rate, okay? If I can convert, right now you're probably in your head, I always convert 100% from A to B, right? But in reality, in a lot of chemical reactions, we cannot do that. So that's what we call it equilibrium, okay? Equilibrium. For some reactions, you can say from A to B, but a lot of cases actually may be from B to A, so that's, we call it, is this supposed to be spontaneous or not? That's also thermodynamics, okay? So all of this is supposed to be in the AP test, okay? They always tell you about those things. So we have to start it from this uh, fundamental. So therefore, we started to understand these structures. From this atom, to build up this molecule. From molecule, we build up this uh, matter, okay? So that's what we call it stepwise. And then, if you look at this entire this uh, this uh, chemistry, how they build up, the logic behind that is actually follow this this rule: atom to the molecule, from molecule to the substance. Okay. So, therefore, what's the meaning of atom? Right now, at the very beginning, we just say this is only the smallest unit for the element. Okay, for the element. Then, then we have this element concept. What's the, what's the meaning of the element? So next chapter we will talk about atom. You will see atom. We have three components in atom. Okay. But for the element, we only talk about the atom. So therefore, element meaning one type of a atom. For example, if we have oxygen, this is supposed to be element. If we have ozone, this is also element. Why is there element? Because I only have one type of atom. Okay. Sometimes we also write down sulfur like this, S8. This is also element. Sometimes we write down phosphorus, it's a P4. This is also element. So it doesn't matter how many those atoms we have, as long as it's a one type, we call it element. So therefore, we have periodic table. So entire periodic table, every single one we call it element, right? Because it's only one atom, one type of atom, okay? Then from there, a lot of things, not just one, one kind of, one type of atom. We also have more than one, right? Two or more. So, so things like uh, water, right? Every single day we have to drink water. Versus uh, we have this uh, hydrogen peroxide, right? You don't, you don't drink this guy. This guy you can buy it from the, from Wolverine or CVS. Pretty much somewhere between three to five percent. This is hydrogen peroxide. On water, as you can see, both of them, they have the two different types of atoms in there. They are the same, actually, combination. In terms of a type of atom, they are the same. So those, we give a name, we call it compound. So therefore, we have to understand all of this, all of this. Understand what, you may ask, right? In this case, we call it properties. We try to understand all of these guys' properties. So we have to talk about the properties, and we have to talk about this uh, change. Right? You want to change from one to the other, therefore, you can deal with those guys. So, properties, yeah, sure. So properties supposed to be about two different type of properties. It's a very big kind of like 
separation, one we call our extensive properties. One we call the extensive properties. The other we call our intensive properties. So the differences between these two things, extensive properties are supposed to be the you're changing the amount of this substance. This property will change accordingly. That's what we call an extensive property. Intensive meaning I'm changing the amount of substance. This property doesn't change. Okay. So to separate these two things, later when we learn in the in the thermodynamics and also electrochemistry, very very important. If you don't separate these two things, you easily mess up the calculation very quickly. Okay. So to understand this, I'll give you an example. The extensive property, you can think about is a, this volume of gas. After adding more gas in the system, the volume actually got bigger and bigger. Okay? So that's meaning I'm changing the amount of substance, the volume change accordingly. Okay? Either increasing the amount of substance, volume got bigger, or I get take out some gas, the volume got smaller. Okay? So those Volume obviously is supposed to be the extensive property. Okay? For intensive property, you think about it as a density of water or melting point of water. So you can think about if I have a one gram of water versus a hundred gram of water, is the water density going to be a hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred times larger for one hundred gram of water compared to one gram of water? So we'll do that the same. Yeah. So all properties should be extensive, right? Because all properties, okay. Because if you like have zero grams of a substance, like, mm -hmm. none of it applies, right? Yeah. Everybody agree with him or not? Yes? So all the properties are going to be extensive properties? Agree? No. Can you give me an example why you're not going to agree with him? Yes. Because if there were zero grams of substance, it would just not exist and it would be relevant to the problem. Zero grams. Okay. And you have zero grams, what does that mean? <laughs> there is neither extensive or intensive property exists. But we say what? We say it depends on this uh, amount, right? Okay, you can have zero gram and you can have, you gotta change it a little bit, right? <laughs> right? Because you have to see the change, and then you see this uh, property to respond is change, right? If you don't have change, I don't know. Because <laughs> the property, if you understand, if you think about it, it's pretty much what we, we try, to, try to understand is that this, this whole nature, this whole world, the physical world, we do a lot of things, evaluation what? I'm changing something to see these things that respond, right? So same thing over here, so that's why we see, we say that it depends on this, uh, amount of substance, right? Okay? So, for, for intensive, extensive, intensive sometimes is a, a little bit of not that easy to figure out. So, one thing is the density of this, uh, uh, density, really, density, okay? So, you, you can think about the water, right? We just use water as an example. So you got a one cup of water versus two cup of water, you mix them together. The water density doesn't change, right? You double the, the amount of water, you don't change, you don't double the density of water, right? Okay. So the other one is supposed to be, supposed to be what? Melting point or boiling point of the, of the substance. It's always fixed. So you heat up one cup of coffee versus a, a, a big bucket of coffee is, is supposed to be the melting pot is supposed to be the same. Okay. Right, so any question about this part? Because uh, later we'll talk about uh, things like uh, heat later, voltage versus the potential, we we'll call reduction potential. And this energy, energy later we're gonna, we're gonna learn, is, we got a it's free energy the enthalpy, these guys are going to be the extensive properties. And the application, or we try to use those uh, properties that can help us a lot in understanding this uh, chemical reaction. Okay. 
So that's why we have a lot of laws. Those laws actually depends on those uh, those properties, it's extensive properties or which is intensive properties. So that's the properties. And then we move on to the physical chain, physical property, chemical chain, chemical properties. So for those who you already learned this, and anyone give me an example about a physical change? One example about a chemical change. Yeah? Uh, an iron. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you bend an iron nail, it's going to stay. It's a physical property because it doesn't really change the other chemical form. But if it rusts, then that's a chemical form. That's right. How about yours? About melting. melting, freezing, freezing. that's a physical. physical and then chemical. Mm -hmm. Chemical, can you give me chemical one? Like adding different elements into the water. Adding different elements into the water. Like making the elements into a compound. Like chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. Yes, so maybe one example. I don't know. Maybe tonight if we go back home. You can, you can Google the YouTube. You try to see sodium react with water. What's gonna happen, right? You put a piece of sodium into water. So the sodium actually react with water very vigorously. So you actually catch the flame. So that's exactly the slowly the chemical reaction. Basically, the sodium is gone. The water also changed. So it changed to some other substance. As we call it, chemical reactor. Right? So I always ask the class every single time, it's more like, have you guys visited to the New York City? Have you been there? Have you seen the Statues of Liberty? What's the color? Green. 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 Why is green? Rusty. It's rusty from what? They're changing which element to what? Copper and Copper, right? Orange and orange supposed to be what? Copper, right? Copper is what color? It's brown, right? Shiny brown color. Mm -hmm. After how many years? Like 100 years, 200 years of that guy? Right now. Years, yeah. more, than a, more than 100 years, right? Wait, is it given like 18 something? Yeah, no. I, think, uh, I think it's 18 something. 18 something? Oh, because um, I remember this as a trivia question at my camp. I cheated and then used my phone and then Googled it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's supposed to be the chemical reaction, right? You're changing the copper to not the copper. It's supposed to be maybe copper oxide or maybe copper hydroxide, copper something else. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. So, this case, because uh, we have to go through this uh, again about this uh, phase change. So, we have. Physical chain, obviously, solid, liquid, and gas, okay? And then you have to remember right now, because even for your owner chemistry, you have to remember because you want to take the SAG test. So therefore, if I have a solid changing to the liquid, what we call? That's it. Melting. Melting, right? Okay. Liquid goes back to solid, what we call? Freezing. Freezing, right? Okay. Liquid to the gas. Vaporization. Vaporization, right? Very important. Vaporization, okay? Vaporization. Okay. Gas goes back to the liquid. Condensation. Condensation. Very good. Solid. Solid to gas. Sublimation. Sublimation, right? Okay. Gas goes back to solid. Deposition, right? Uh -huh. Not composition. <laughs> okay, this is supposed to be not deposition, okay? I was thinking that, but I said the wrong thing. Close yeah, sublimation. So, from now on, you got to remember all of this. Because uh, later, when we're dealing with this uh, phase change, we call a heating curve. We have a phase diagram. And then you have to calculate the uh, energy involved. So you got you better know this each one of these names. Okay. This is condensation. Okay. So therefore, 
So right now it's a level, right? Doesn't matter you learn the other chemistry or not. So right now you know you all know this uh, from this uh, AP class. Okay. No excuse, because uh, we will be dealing with this guy later. Okay. For this one is a rusty stuff. Okay. This is a obviously a chemical reaction, which means uh, this is a element to give you different, or you can say a substance from one type of substance to the others by changing this, which means chemical reaction. Chemical reaction. Okay, and then we're going to talk about this. Uh, they have uh, so many things. It's a little bit uh, kind of like a random, but they all eventually come together, give you all. Oh, this is a chemistry. Okay, in this case, we're going to separate the, the, the matters. It's classification, right? Classification meaning sorted out. This is actually very broad separation, very big uh, category. Starting from mixture compared with the pure substance. For pure substance, you only have uh, the element plus the compound. Because you only have one substance, one matter in there. This can be element, this can be compound. So pure substance is okay. Everything is the same. This one is everything is not the same. So which means I have a, a mixture, blend, everything. Different type of things come together. Okay. That's called a mixture. So based on these uh, this different matters, you put them together, it depends on their their face. Are they the same face? Gas, liquid, or solid? Or they are different? They call a homogeneous versus a which is heterogeneous, okay, heterogeneous. So in this case, we have this uh, homogeneous meaning everything, they are the same phase. So you think about this room, full of air, right? So in air, what do we have? Air is a mixture, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So air, we have what? Oxygen. 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 Yes. <laughs> And then we have water vapor. Actually, we, water vapor. we also have this guy. Okay. Argon. Argon. Gone, sorry. Argon, okay. So argon is supposed to be the... Yes, argon is... Okay, so that's another thing. You go back to get a pure table. So, um, what's the best way? To, what's the best way? You can actually... I want you to get a pure table, not... You can use this online one, you can use that, and then there's a lot of information that will help you a lot, right? However, in the test, you don't have that. So I want you to get a copy of a AP test. Oh, I do have one. Actually, I have two. One yeah. in blue, one in white. Oh, good. My teacher was very thorough. Okay. So if you don't have it, I will bring a hard copy next time. You can make a photocopy or things like that. So. Every single time you want to bring those uh, pure table with you, okay, you gotta use it. Okay. So, so that's the thing. And then this is actually, indeed, this is argon, it's supposed to be the third abundant element in the air. You guys know that? The first one is nitrogen, second one is oxygen, third one is actually argon. Okay. And I think one time, one time, they, they test these guys in the SAT test. It's a long time ago. They don't test these things anymore. They thought, they thought right now the philosophy in the college board, anything you need to remember, they say it's not knowledge. They don't require to remember anything. However, however, it's a big but actually. For chemistry, you do need to remember something. Okay? You will see this from, because of, we, are, we also have an hour to finish this class. For the next chapter, when I talk about these ions, you got to remember that. Otherwise, you cannot write down the formula. Understand? Chemistry really requires you guys to remember something. Because uh, let me tell you, my experience when I learned chemistry at the very beginning, it's like a middle school, the last year in the middle school. The first class, the teacher said, after two weeks, you guys need to remember the periodic table. Oh, oh man. Oh, yes. Yeah, the reason for that is that you guys are so 
fortune to get a periodic table in a test. We don't have periodic table. We have to put everything in here. Okay? I remember watching my friends suffering through memorizing periodic Yes. The reason for that is, uh, is, is what? It's a, more like a, literally, they give you the periodic table, they give you the entire chemistry book if you know how to decipher the code in the periodic table. Everything in the periodic table. Okay. Anyway, this is something we're going to go back and forth. <laughs> okay, so when I say you got to remember this, do it, okay? Because that's work for you, for the whole things carry you long term, not just for chemistry, later in your career, also very important. Okay. Anyway, we go back to chemistry. <laughs> so we try to use the flow chart. You're going to see quite a bit of these things in different format as well in AP. This is, a, this is doing what? To help you guys to summarize. solve the problem, summarize. So this is a, you may want to do your own version, okay? Make some like a card for you guys to organize the organize the information concept and that will you've got to better understand okay classification so first thing you come in whatever the system they give it to you understand is it uniform we uniform mean what do i have a multiple things in there or not is it single things or multiple things it's supposed to be the different phases gas liquids solid or not so therefore you can quickly identify do i have a heterogeneous, do I have a homogeneous, right? So these things were quickly set, separated, right? And then we have this homogeneous will come down. Is this supposed to be one substance or is it a multiple substance in there? So for example, the solution, we're gonna deal with a lot of solution in chemistry. It's always a homogeneous mixture, okay? Homogeneous mixture. Because you have at least two things in there, at least. And then if you only have one, in this case, all of this depends on what? Matters, depends on like a substance, right? Molecule, element, right? And then you come to pure substance, you only end it up with what? You end up with evaluate the atom, right? One more level down, right? So therefore, I understand if it's only one type of all atom, we got an element. So therefore, you see that concept right there, right? This is a concept, right? Element is a concept. So therefore, I gave you a bunch of multiple choice questions. They ask you, which one is the element? They give you molecule, give you element. And then you, you need to understand what's the meaning of the element, right? If you have more than one type of atom, you've got a compound, okay, separately. So generally, compound, we normally also say some molecule, okay, molecule. So, I'm trying to also show you guys how to <coughs> learn chemistry, how to learn chemistry. All right, so once we have this, we also need to talk about, if you go back to here, is that great? Separation. Separation in chemistry is very important. Okay. Separation. In other words, I can make a lot of things, but it, those things, are, if they are not in very reasonable purity, is basically not good for us because we cannot understand their property very well and we cannot use that for the application to make something else because you got a mixture right and that's why separation in chemistry is always always a very very important part so we're going to talk about this case is a uh, these three <coughs> but for AP chemistry we're going to focus on this uh, chromatography a little bit more because last year they test you this guy in the AP test, free response question. How to understand, how to use it. Chromatography to identify the substance. Okay, I'll show you how to do it. Okay. All right, so this is a, <clears throat> for each one of these uh, separation technique, okay, you need to know what's the principle, what property we use to, to do this separation, right? Because that's why we started a lot of properties. Later you can use this property to do something, right? Help you. So in this case, we have this we call a distillation. Distillation typically you have a mixture about a liquid, okay, liquid. And then distillation obviously depends on different liquid has different boiling point. We use boiling point 
to separate the, the liquid. That's called a distillation. This one is important actually in industry. If you see this refinery from this, uh, this oil industry, right? every time you, you got crude oil, and then you try to separate for different components, that's depends on this uh, distillation. distillation. This distillation is also important in a lot of cases, actually, in the, we call it organic chemistry. We make a lot of uh, different compounds, and then we try to separate them. It's actually dependent on this, uh, this technique. Okay. A lot. So therefore, we need to get a little bit in detail and pay attention to the setup. In particular, this thermometer, where this thermometer is positioned, where it's located. As you can see, I didn't put them into the into the, this uh, mixture, this liquid. Why? Why we why we why we don't put this thermometer into this uh, this mixture of liquid? You're fine. You know that. <laughs> we just talk about. Anyone else? We try to use this. Uh, this distillation depends on what? Depends on the boiling point, right? The differences of boiling point for, from different liquids, right? So how can we measure the boiling point properly? If we put this thermometer into the solution, what's going to happen? What's the temperature you measure? You measure the, the one coming out, the pure liquid, as, as a mixture, right? We don't want that. That's useless, right? So in this case, I need to put the thermometer right over here, close to this uh, this vapor coming out with projection, meaning whatever is a liquid compared to the gas, they're gonna they're gonna condense a little bit over here. Right? When they condense, they give you what? Boiling point, right? So in this projection, I can precisely measure the boiling point of the liquid, right? If you put it into the solution, I mean to the mixture, I cannot do that. After measurement, okay. so this this part also being tested before, okay. All right? So this is a distillation. Once you have this vapor coming out, so this come over here, we change the vapor to the liquid. That's why you see this piece of glass where we call that. You're changing the liquid. You're changing the gas to the liquid. This process in the phase change we call that condensation, right? So therefore, this piece of glass where we call that condenser. Okay. And then you have water flow in and flow out. It's more like a cold finger. Um, I, I, I'm trying to figure out the, the experiment you may have with things. Refrigerator, you got an ice pack, right? If you eat ice cream, so in the in the in the bowl, right? The outside is gonna gonna have water. Condense a little bit of water in there, right? If it's cold enough, right? So that's basically the same idea, so we condense condensation. The, the vapor changing from, from gas to the liquid. And then things coming out, you collect it, and then they, whatever is coming out, this, this part, we call it distillate. Okay? You can have one, two, three, four, it depends on where these things are in there, right? How many, how many different liquid in there. So once you have the first one coming out, and then you, you're going to increase in the temperature again, right? And then reach the second liquid, there is another boiling point, and then you have a second desolate, and then so on and so forth. That's the distillation. Distillation. Okay. And let me ask you, can I separate this, uh, this desolation with, uh, with a solid? No. Let's say, okay. Let's say do this way. Because uh, if I have water, right? Water is the only liquid in this case, and then I dissolve this sugar in there. Can I separate them by this? No. Yes or no? Can I get the water and then get the, get the sugar back? Okay. Can you do the filtration? If you put sugar into water, like filtration, you, water yeah. is still liquid, so it just it doesn't filter out. It's like, it would be like, if it's all neutral. Yeah, so when you dry it, what that mean? This is basically you doing this, right? That's a drying, right? You heat it up, it's just to make this drying evaporation faster, right? So you, for this system, you can you definitely can use this to, to crack the water. Whatever left behind, that's what? 
sugar. Yeah, you can do. You can use it, right? You guys probably know this. How can we get this? Uh, this a uh, sea salt, right? If somebody just collect the seawater and right? leave it there, evaporate it, right? I did that experiment. Oh, you did that? Yes. Okay. In third grade. <laughs> Excellent. That's basically. You think about this is basically the same same principle, isn't it? It's just how fast this process is gonna be, right? Right. Okay. So this uh, thing about it is you can do it, you can do it. So this meaning, if I have a solid, I have a, I have a homogeneous versus a heterogeneous, I can do these things as long as, uh, as long as I heat up to this whatever is a liquid, the boiling point, there's supposed to be no reaction happen. I'm not gonna change any of this guy. If there's reaction happen, I cannot do it anymore, right? Because I destroy this guy, right? I'm not gonna recover these two components. So that's the that's the thing you have to you have to be careful, okay? And that's actually the industry to get the gasoline, right? They heat it up, heat it up, heat it up. Eventually, they don't heat it up anymore because uh, whatever left behind, the boiling point is so high. So you gotta you gotta why you gotta candle wax? Where to get the wax coming from? That's eventually whatever is a crude oil, whatever easily evaporated based on the distillation. You already get all of them out. Whatever left behind with a very high boiling point. That's why I give you the wax. Okay. That's pretty much the hydrocarbon stuff. Okay. Okay. So same thing. Okay. Same thing. So this is about the distillation. And now we move on filtration. Filtration, pretty straightforward, right? Because I last previous class, they gave me the example is that you guys drink coffee, right? Go to Starbucks. How do they make a coffee for you? It's pretty much the filtration, right? <laughs> Is that filtration? Think about it, right? You ground it, you got a coffee, you put them into the kind of like a filter paper, you put the hot water through it, and then you got this, uh, you got a coffee, right? The coffee meaning whatever the liquid is separated from is a solid, right? That's a filtration. So what we're gonna use this in the chemistry, later we will talk about one type of reaction we call a precipitation reaction. Okay. Precipitation reaction. Precipitation meaning I do have this uh, insoluble solid from. I need to separate them. I, have to, I need to collect those uh, insoluble product. How to do that? I'm going to use this uh, filtration technique. Okay. Filtration technique. Okay. So therefore, we have uh, it's a this we call a filter. We call a, generally we call a we call a thermal. It's thermal, and then we have this a uh, this. White wine is supposed to be the filter paper. And then you fold it, you put it in, you put this uh, solution, this whatever, this, uh, this mixture through it. And then liquid pass through this filter, you collect this, uh, this solid residue. Okay. And then you dry it, and you measure the mass before and after. You figure out what's the precipitate, how many grams that is produced in this reaction. And then you can go back to calculation for that yield, percent of yield. You want to learn all of this. Okay. So this is the filtration. Uh, next time, next week, I will bring over a simple setup to do this uh, chromatography experiment. But I will go through this uh, principle for this, uh, for this. And then you guys need to know this. Chromatography. Chromatography is a right side. Where that black pink? Okay. So I'm gonna ask you, you got a you got a black ink, right? You think this black ink is just one ink in there or is a mixture of this a different different dye and molecule in there? It's a mixture. It's a mixture, right? So it's more like this. I got a I got a black ink and then I do this a paper. This normally we call a paper chromatography. We can separate them. In general, a black ink, they have three different dyes. Okay? Three different dyes in there. It's like a red, I think a red, blue, and uh, green. So three. You will see that I will have this demo. So in this case, what you have is uh, you have this uh, this is more like a a baker, and then you have this 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 projector. Is, I cannot see this. This is supposed to be a little bit color over here. So you can imagine, just think about this, we have a, we have a solvent over here, okay? 
this fill up with solvent. In this case, the solvent thing is supposed to be in water, okay? It's okay. Later, you will learn water is supposed to be a, a polar molecule. Polar molecule. And then you have this substrate. Substrate. This typically a piece of paper, or filter paper. And then we call it this, uh, this, this water actually can, based on this uh, capillary force, it can move around this piece of paper, right? So when you dry your, dry your hand with a paper towel, what's, what's happening? It's basically the same. They absorb, they absorb this, why they absorb? Because capillary force, right? They absorb the water. So then the water move up, move up. And then depends on what kind of molecule we have, this molecule will interact they have they call it molecule molecule interaction. So we actually have one chapter specifically talking about this uh, intermolecular we call it intermolecular forces. It's molecule molecule interaction. This molecule molecule interaction is depends on this uh, this molecules that we call a polarity. So you will learn all of this. Okay, polarity different. They will have different we call a solubility. Okay, so this case. Because of this uh, polarity different about this dye molecule, whichever the dye interact with water strongly, they're gonna go along with water, right? So therefore, water move whatever the distance. This guy is gonna move a little bit longer distance, right? Whatever the dye molecule interact with water very weak, they lag behind, right? Weak meaning they're gonna interact with the substrate actually stronger, right? So after certain distance. They're gonna separate different molecules. Okay. So therefore you know how many those spot those spot, you know how many different molecules we have in the in the in this in this mixture, right? It's a mixture. So this we separate this uh, this molecule. This one is very important in the modern industry for like a pharmaceutical. Okay. Another example is more like a you guys watch this uh, this is this this year? What Olympic game, right? And then they and then they go, oh this 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 athlete they do this doping right? How they found it out? Based on this, they have a big library of different they call a performance enhanced drug right? And they they collect your sample and they run these things, and then they they know if you dope or not. They do this calculation. Oh, I found this molecule. And you have this one match. You're done, right? Okay. So therefore, this we call a retention factor. You have the calculation. Because right now, if we have this very, we do have this very, very advanced, sophisticated instrument can do these things are very effective, and also with very short time. Okay. So they always depend on this, and then they have a big, big uh, database. So therefore, any molecule coming out, they do a quick match based on this uh, retention factor. Okay. Things like this. You run your experiment, you, have, you identify all of this based on specific of this uh, solvent. Okay? You have to have the same condition using the same solvent and same substrate to do the same experiment. Otherwise, these things will be different, right? So that's the kind of like that. You can, you can always standardize these things, right? Easy. I just set up this protocol, everybody follow the same thing, and then we can do the comparison. So in this case, the decent, remember we talk about, we have a solvent, the solvent travel, solvent got a distance, so therefore we have this solvent distance. This solvent in normal says that uh, illusion, we call it a mobile phase in this chromatography. Uh, and then this piece of paper, we call it uh, a stationary, stationary phase, which means they don't change, they don't, they don't move around. In this case, they move things, and then we have this distance, from this, this orange, whatever the line you draw the line, and then you, you measure these things as solvent front. So that will give you this uh, distance for solvent travel. And then we also have this uh, each component, right? You measure from the center of this component, you also have a distance they travel for each one of these molecules. So therefore, this uh, two distance ratio we call a retention factor. Okay. So this, if I know these two molecules, right, one and two, I and then I have an unknown sample coming in, I run the same experiment, and then I can measure this uh, retention factor, right? And then I can compare. If this, this component 
the return factor is equal to this one, I, okay, this is match to the component two. And then you know component two is supposed to be what molecule, so you identify this molecule, okay? That's how we identify the molecule, okay? So therefore, this retention factor is, a, is actually quite important part of this, uh, this identification. So all of this actually, we talk about, we say, based on this, uh, this polarity of the molecule, right? So we will talk about this one more time. When we're dealing with this, we call a molecular polarity intermolecular functions. We will come back to this things when we talk about that chapter, okay? So that's actually, relatively we say, if I have this uh, solvent, is a polar solvent, when I remove, along with the, this water, let's, let's say this polar molecule, this guy is supposed to be more polar than this guy, right? Because the polar polar, they have a stronger interaction. So therefore, when you move along with this solvent, obviously you're gonna interact with the solvent strongly. So this, this meaning, this one, if the solvent is polar, so therefore this one is more polar than whoever like behind. So you can identify the polarity relative, say which one is more polar, which one is a non, which one is a less polar or more non-polar. Okay. Understand? Okay, so this is a, this pretty much the, as you can see, they can design something to test you based on this, right? They give you the molecule, you know the mo you need to identify this molecule, the polarity. And then they give you those things to ask you, is component one is more polar or component two is more polar? You based on this uh, solvent polarity to determine that. Okay? Alright, this is about uh, chromatography. So next class I will bring a simple setup, you will see how these things are done. It's pretty easy and pretty fun. Uh, experiment. Okay. All right. So we we're gonna talk about this periodic table. So for those uh, you already learned chemistry, this is a piece of cake. You already know all of this. For those you haven't learned things, I will go quick. Uh, what you see is that we call a group of families. We also have this we call a period. So the group sort of be all these uh, column. You see, this column is supposed to be the okay. Yeah, group family. The reason for that we call it a group of family because uh, whenever you see those elements, they are in the same group. They supposed to be have a very similar physical and chemical properties. It's more like a, a family member, right? We put a similar people in the family. That's why we put a, those elements with a pretty much similar and physical, physical chemical properties together in the same group, in the same group. Later, you will learn why those guys in the same group, okay? And those group numbers, there's a meaning in there, okay? You will see this right away. <laughs> so therefore, you need to know all of this. And then, for example, why over here there's only two groups? Over here, six. Over here is 10. If you, and over here is 14. Why this one is not, not, not four? And why this here not 15? Why this here not 21? Why is that? Okay. So therefore, like I said before, they give you the periodic table. They basically give you the chemistry book. Okay. And then you know those numbers. Actually, there's a meaning in there. Okay. And what's in there? What's the information in there? Okay. So this is about a group family. We also see these are uh, rows, horizontals. You also see the number, right? This number also there's a meaning associated with it. Right? So all of this give you the information, help you to understand the chemistry. Okay, after this class, for you guys, at least you need to remember one, two, three, four. There's a four, four period plus over here, those elements. Their name, chemical symbols. Okay. The reason for that is, uh, you don't have name. I pick up it with name. I give you a lot of the information here. In chemistry test, you only have this. You don't have none of this. This number you will see. That's what we call an atomic number. This number we call a atomic mass. And then you have this symbol. That's all you have. Okay. So the rest of them, 
what's the name of these guys, right? And they, in the test, they give you the name of this uh, compound, and then you don't know how to write down this formula, what's going to happen? You basically cannot answer the question at all, right? Because you cannot write down any chemical reaction. So that's why. Okay? So this is the this is the periodic table. And then from here I say the group and then the period. You also see these things are color coded, right? Some of these colors over here, color over here, and over here, over here, and over here. So this actually we separate this uh, this element based on we call it metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Because these things also help you later identify what kind of compound we have. Okay. So therefore, all of these over here, you see these border lines over here? So this, anything along with this, these are the metal elements. So our, apparently, we have a lot of uh, metals, right? In the period table, and then we have this uh, only this part of this uh, element we call a non-metal element, not a lot, only over here. And this one we call a noble gases. This one we call a holocenes. Okay, and over here the first group we call a alkali metals. This one is a alkaline earth metals. Over here we call a transition metals. And these we call inner transition metals. They also have a specific name. Yes? Are the red ones um, Ooh. Yes. Red ones are, they call artificial elements. It's not happening in the nature. It's made by us, man-made elements. One of them actually, right here, Berkeley. We have a, it's Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. You see this LV? It's a Livermorium. It's made over there. <laughs> is that amazing? This one is already. This one is already officially. This uh, this the element already officially yeah recognized by the entire kind of community. Okay. So anyway, that's very good. Very good point. Very good question. Okay. So therefore, we see this supposed to be the the metals. These are the non-metals. And then I give you some of them, their group names. Can you try to remember that? And then if not, we're going to repeat it multiple times. And then we're going to see this zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. This guy's only six elements, plus one radioactive one. Those we call the metalloids. It's a borderline between metals and then non metals. So therefore, they have a little bit of property towards the metal, a little bit on the non metals. Okay. So therefore, you may ask, What's the meaning of metals? What property for metals? What property for non-metals, right? So we're gonna do a quick summary about this. The metals, non-metals, metalloids, a little bit on this uh, noble gases. Okay. So the first thing is metals. Metals, obviously, uh, you probably know this. Metal is a very good conductor for both heat and the electricity, right? So therefore, it's easy to identify, right? If they give you a bunch of the element, right? Give you compound element in your multiple choice, they are gonna ask you which one is metals, which one is non-metals, which one is metal lord. Okay, you gotta remember that. That's why. Even though they give you the periodic table, those periodic table is not the one that uh, you just saw is a color coded. You only have a, a black and white copy. <laughs> So therefore, where are you looking for these metals? Where are you looking for the non-metals? Where is the metal laws located? Okay, spend like, I gave you a month to familiar with that, okay? Not two weeks, <laughs> four weeks, okay? All right, so this is supposed to be the metals, and then we also these are properties of metals. So what's the meaning of uh, malleability? Anybody? Yes? Yes, after shake, it means you beat, you beat the metals, you got a big chunk of metal, and then beat, you make a what? You're very thin, very thin, is a foil, right? Yeah. You got a foil. So, pretty much, all your, if you go back home, go to the kitchen, you ask your mom, where is the aluminum foil? You probably have a, a roll of aluminum foil at home, somewhere, right? 
So that's supposed to be the, based on this metal, they have this uh, vulnerability, okay? Which means they can change, change the shape. Ductility is very similar. Ductility meaning what? You see all of this wear, right? Inside of the metal, right? So basically changing from bulk material to the metal wear. Copper wear, silver wear, and then make it, make a thread, right? Uh, you then those strings. So you probably see this uh, Golden Gate Bridge, right? You see this big cable, right? Hold this bridge in shape, right? Why? Mechanical screen, right? This basically is a mechanical screen. So that's why we use a lot of like, a, like a iron on these pieces to build up this, uh, this building, right? Very tall building, skyrocket building. So that's based on this uh, metal. They have these very strong screens. And then I guess all of you guys have the experience to take an airplane, right? Fly around, right? So whatever is the airplane, the outside is, is actually what? Aluminum alloy, right? Why? But why? They have to have a certain strength for the entire things in shape, right? Also the car, right? everything. The last one is easy to understand, right? Color, give you shiny, beautiful color, that's called luster, right? Mm -hmm. As you can see here, right? So you guys probably later jewelry, right? You got a gold, you got a silver, you got a palladium, or things like that, right? Why? These guys give you very shiny, beautiful colors. For non-metals, it's pretty much opposite to these metals. Those guys, in terms of uh, heat and electricity, they are very poor for this uh, for, as a conductor for that. But there's a one exception. There's a one exception. For non-metals, it's a very good conductor. Anyone knows which one? And you pretty much use it every day. Carbon? Yes, carbon what? Carbon. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you see carbon, oops, this one's there. If you see carbon, we have two types of carbon right now, in general, in this case. We have a, one is called a diamond, the other we call a graphite. Okay, actually this graphite is a, is a very good conductor, okay? The graphite is what? It's the pencil lead, you use it pretty much every day. Okay, so therefore graphite. The pencil lead is a conductor. And if you buy if you buy a battery, one of these electrodes is made of this graphite. Okay. Okay. If you go to whatever is a grocery store to buy the batteries, one of them. So remember, this has also been tested before. Okay. It's a non-metal element, but uh, with a very good conductor for for the electricity. So why is it not considered? A why is not considered what? A Oh. Okay, very good question. Anyone anyone can answer his question? Is it carbon? Where is the carbon located? Let's go back to the PR table. Tell me where is the carbon located? Oh, it's a metal. Is it metal or no, not metal? metal? This is a metal line. This is the bottom line. Over here is a metal. Over here is the non metals. Carbon is a non metal. Yes. Okay. Actually, carbon is actually the element for organic chemistry. Look at a human body, right? Mm -hmm. So, in our body, we have a lot of what? Water in there, right? Besides water, it's pretty much the carbon, a lot of carbon. The food we, we eat, right, is, a, is actually from carbon. Carbon is a non-metal. So therefore, this graphite is diamond is just a, these are the element, okay? Diamond, graphite are element, because we only have carbon in there, nothing else. Okay? So as you can see here, so this girls remember, the diamond is actually from carbon. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, you learn the country and you know, oh, diamond, you give me diamond, oh, great, it's it carbon. Carbon. <laughs> you don't give me some carbon. <laughs> okay, and actually we can change these guys back and forth, okay, but not that easy, not that easy. Okay. 
where you just make time out of your battery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. This is a this is a metal, non-metal, and then we have metal oil. Metal oil. Like I said, these are six one: boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and thorium. We have one is a polyton, plutonium. A plutonium. It's supposed to be polonium. It's supposed to be the radioactive material. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you look at these pictures, so this one is a metal, right? Mm -hmm. This one is a sulfur, not metal. Non metal? Yes, this one is non metal. Sulfur. Sulfur crystal. They can also crystallize, make a beautiful crystal. Anyone have any idea about this? Is it silicon? Yes, silicon. So here, what we call Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. It's pretty much uh, the entire things, entire industry depends on this guy. <laughs> okay, it's from kind of Silicon Ingro. So where we make these things is from sand. Sand is what? Carbon. <laughs> no carbon. No carbon. Sand is a uh, is this silicon dioxide. Majority of the components will be this, and then we have. We have a lot of this is sodium, potassium, and calcium, calcium. those things in there. And this silicon dioxide is over here, is, is glass. Is that great from those guys? Okay. So later you want to learn all of these, this one, this one, plus this, plus silicon. They call it covalent network. Molecule. Okay, covalent network molecule. Yes. What's the last picture? Is it two portions? This one? Yeah. Oh, I will, I will, I will tell you. <laughs> well, we, we, we talk about this. This one you need to know, okay? Those guys will be the covalent network compound, okay? Molecule. Diamond, graphite, silicon dioxide, silicon, silicon, this guy. This is what is over here, noble gases. You know the neon light, right? You know the neon light? If you go to like a, yes, the, the local, like a, like, like a restaurant. restaurant, or this is the, kind of like a grocery store, right? You have this, this neon open. sign. No, open, like yeah. Open, closed. Yes. Um, yeah, that's supposed to be that neon, neon gas in there. Okay, neon. And all these guys, actually, you know this one already, right? The fluorescent slide. So what's in there? Mercury. Mercury vapor, right? Mercury. And then, tonight, if you go on the street, you see what's the color of the street light. When we go home, it's still bright. Oh, that's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> so maybe during the night, you go out to take a look at your neighborhood, what color of the light. Yeah, yeah. What was color? No. Typical is a silver orange. orange or yellow. It's more like a very ugly yellow, right? Eh? <laughs> yes. And then, do you know what's, what's the element in there? It's a, it's a sodium vapor, sodium. Oh. This guy. Okay, this guy. We're going to talk about this when we talk about this, uh, this atomic structure, electron configuration. So actually, different elements, they do have a specific color associated with it. Okay. When we talk about that, so you probably s watch this uh, July 4th fireworks, right? Mm -hmm. No? Mm -hmm. But you do watch the fireworks before, right? Why do you have different colors of fireworks? Where does color come from? Because they use different elements. Yes, they have different laser elements in their compound. Okay. So therefore, they have different colors. So where does color come from? It's Something about this, these things as well, okay? All right, so this is supposed to be the first chapter. Wait, yes, go ahead. So what's it for noble gases? Oh, different noble gases. This one, the first one is a helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. Oh, wait, what's the definition? What's the definition of noble gases? Yeah. The definition of noble gases is uh, this guy is uh, very stable. Because these things are noble, right? They don't want to touch with anybody, right? Virtual. Mm -hmm. Virtual, right? Whatever. This meaning, these are so stable. They don't react with uh, any others. 
just by themselves. So this case we normally say it's a monatomic molecule. Even by itself, just by itself. Why is that? We will learn. Okay, we will know why is that. It's just so stable, this guy's very stable. But later when we learn more, I, we actually can make some compound from those guys, okay? It's, that's relatively it's stable. It depends on which element we're talking about. Okay. So this is the this is the first part of this uh, this first chapter. So we finish the first chapter of this uh, this, and then we're gonna move on to the second one. Okay. You guys want to take a a a, a break or continue? I think when we take a break, it's just the end of class. Right? You, oh yes, not the end of the class. We still have next chapter. We can take a break and then we come back because this is almost like a for you guys like a long two hours already. Are we leaving at seven? No, you're not leaving at seven. You're leaving at seven thirty. Oh, That's no, why I'm saying. Three hours long. No one. No. Two and a half hours. Yeah, we yeah. started at four thirty. Mm -hmm. We started four thirty, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So it ends at seven. Yes. That's why I'm saying. You said seven thirty. Wow, maybe. Oh. <laughs> so everyone clear. Oh, okay, okay. I got. I thought it's seven thirty or something. Okay. If that's the case, we just do a little bit exercise together. We still have. Is that okay? Or do you want to go home? <laughs> okay. Let's see the first chapter. What's the exercise things we have? Got a piece of rock, you can, you can go somewhere, you, you break it, right? You see this a layer, 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 so actually things separation, right? Okay, so that's about the heterogeneous hitter, stuff. So. Okay, we do these things, let's take a look at this. Let's, is that, is that, can you see it or not? Or I need to. This may be a little bit better because otherwise it's too small. Let's do some of this classification. What's a rice pudding? Homogeneous or heterogeneous? Seawater. Homogeneous, right? Okay. Magnesium. Your substance. It's crushed ice. It's pure substance. Yeah, you got a piece of ice, it's what? Just water itself, right? But it depends how dense of this ice, right? Do you have air trapped in the ice? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Can you get a pure ice without air trapped in there? You can trap air there. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let's let's try fifteen. Uh, <laughs> No, that's oh, that's a U, 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 that's a U,
you know that World oh, War Two. Okay. Okay. Oh, the fat weapon. Yes, yeah, the fat weapon. Yeah, the fat weapon. Yeah, atomic bomb. Yeah, atomic bomb, right? Hiroshima, no, it's, Nasaga, it's, right? It's, it's, it's fat. It's fat man. I, I think it's. I, I don't remember. It's a fat man or a little boy. Too. Something like that. Wait, okay? sure yeah. So yeah. therefore, yeah. when we talk about is a nuclear chemistry, we're gonna see this uh, uranium. So right now we say atomic power plant, right? It's a atomic bomb. This guy. Right, this guy. This one is a uh, nickel. Very good. Ti, Ti, good. Okay. This one is there. Fe, Cn. Oh, really? Okay. You already know that. Good. So, so, so. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Okay. Now they take this. This is a. This is a. This is a good one. If somebody hand you a piece of this, oh, I gave you a piece of gold. <laughs> you just learned it? Try it. You have to smash it with a hammer. Wow. To see the okay. flat. You need to change the density. Yes. So you need to like just do the density thing. Yes. You can also smash with a hammer because if it's iron pyrite, it's going to like break into pieces. Mm -hmm. If it's gold, it just goes into a flat. Like, yeah, yes. but I don't really want to break my gold. What if it's not like, gold? It's like iron pyre. Yeah, but, but you, you can shape it. Exactly you can shape gold because gold. gold is soft. Can you? Can well, you? Well, you can color it. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell based on the color? Just based on this appearance. No. Uh, color. Can you tell? Both are shiny. With both of them. Too okay. Shiny. I gotta remember this. You gotta remind. You, you gotta. You, you got any one of you send me an email. Say so you gotta. You gotta bring these things. I have both. I have this. Uh, this pyre. I have the gold. So next class I will bring over. You can tell. You can tell the differences if you, you know which one is which. Okay. Okay. But you can actually design a lot of these firm, right? Gold. You put them into the fire. This is nothing happen, right? But it's an iron pyrite or what? Combust, right? Change, right? So it's also unsafe to melt it also, now. Gold underwater, it doesn't turn to color. But like, if you put iron pyrite underwater, it, it turns green. Yes, the green meaning what? This guy is actually kind of like a dissolve a little bit, right? Change. There's a chemical reaction going on. Okay. So you, you base it, you based on some like a physical property, like you measure the density, or you based on this chemical property to identify the thing, right? So that's why we started our chemistry, right? Identify a substance, okay? Identify substance. Uh, other stuff. Oh, here. Oh, okay. Let's take a look. This is not too hard. Okay. Yes, okay. I think I'm going to stop here. So, I will see you guys. Uh, Nice. Uh, if you haven't signed up, where's my sign up seat? Also over there. Uh, you sign it up and uh, make sure you have leave your contact information there. Okay. And then you, make, you guys make the decision which class you're gonna see. Because <laughs> you want to do AP or you want you want to do AP. Okay. Your phone? Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.